<laughs> I just keep silent because you just <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the reality behind it. Anyway. Good. If you ask me, I, I can respond. Okay. Uh, <laughs> keep it brief. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, in, in short, uh, there are different ways, uh -huh. uh, different protected area, different way of protection. Uh, protected area, which is centered by the local community, protected by the local community. Okay. But those protected area, protected by national or regional state, protected by scouts in our case. Okay. So what you're getting at is there are multiple hierarchies of protection, yeah. the multiple levels. Yeah. Correct. Does the type of species that we are protecting or ecosystem matter to how we protect it? Sure. Emily says yes. If we're protecting a forest or something that is the equivalent of the land area of the size of Texas, how do we protect that? So we've got to keep in mind the species, we've got to think about what we're protecting for, what do you include, what do you leave out, the type of protection that you're after. I think what's pretty important is what about those people who live right around those areas? Right? Ideally, wouldn't they serve as the best protectors? They know the environment. They know the dynamics. Something to think about. Okay. Above all, there is this need to consider the land rights issues and land tenure claims. A lot of conservation projects fail because we are unclear as to who actually owns the resources. And this brings us to the question of what is called legal plurality. For example, you can own land in Kenya, but you do not own the wildlife on it. In Uganda, baboons and gorillas, when they come onto your property, your property becomes that of the state. Not baboons, sorry, my mistake, but gorillas, yeah, yeah. So when a gorilla comes on your, 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 your land, you have to vacate that land. Until the gorilla now goes away, then you can come back on your land. They pay you off sometimes. They, they pay you off sometimes. There you go. Okay. So there are questions to do with the legal plurality and part of our misunderstanding regarding conservation practice has been inadequate consideration of the land tenure rights associated with people, land, and wildlife. Okay. There's a need to consider this question of who is the owner of the resources. Is this a good thing to actually think about? Ownership. Or are we stewards? Are we acting on behalf of? And within all of this, you're going to have lots of different competing claims, right? And so you have to learn how to reconcile these things. And all of this is leading to the fact that you can't do conservation by simply being a rigidly defined conservationist. Does that make sense to everyone? Mona is like, oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I believe that if we are really to, to adequately consider conservation, conservation we've all, we've talked about this, lots of different people have talked about it, it's inherently complex. But the way in which we are trained to do conservation perhaps doesn't adequately consider some of these non-ecological components. Therefore, might we have to rethink the way in which we are trained to do conservation, to think about questions of land rights political power, patronage, movement, right? Now, a big debate, and please jump in here, guys, when it comes to conserving, is do you conserve a species or do you conserve an ecosystem? Or both? Ideally both, right? My conservationist scientist friends are very quiet. Both? Okay. So, do you guys know what the sloth debates are? 
whether you have one single large protected area or several small protected areas. Seems to me, what would influence that? Whether we want to go for a single large or several small, what, what might influence that? Ben? The availability of land, yes. What else would influence that? Distribution of the distribution of the species. Okay. The viability. The viability of the populations. Okay. That you're trying to conserve. Okay. Great points. Home range. Home range. Pathogen ecology. Pathogen pathogen ecology. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Where are the diseases? How do they control the populations? What is the inflow and outflow? No one has said that. Price or the value of land, right? Human distribution. Human distribution. Where is the, po where is the population clustered? Woo. Seems really complicated. Tamine. The climatic conditions? But which climatic conditions? The current ones or the future ones? For the beginning, the current one. The current one. Okay. Wow, it sounds pretty complicated to me. But that's great because we're in the business of doing complicated things. Right? Mona talked about the price of land. What about our human values that we place on certain species over others? Is a lion valued more than a guinea pig? Definitely. Ben says it's not. Okay. That's great. We don't want to devalue the other one. Okay, but we want to. Ha we want to. We, we want a gradient of value. Is that what you're saying? Hmm. Okay. Town. I would actually say that it's a process of overvaluing the spectacular and the beautiful. Right. I think that's a great point. We overvalue the spectacular and the beautiful. Right? So, how many of you think an ostrich is a beautiful creature? Four out of 20. The Maasai word for ostrich is esidai, which means beautiful. Right? Is a lion beautiful? Figueroa certainly agrees. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if they're beautiful. They, they kill lots of things. I don't like things that kill other things. Aha. OK. How many of you know what a pangolin is? OK. Is a pangolin as important as an elephant? I see a lot of difference. I see nodding heads and some that go, mm. <laughs> right? Town mentioned an economic consideration. We overvalue certain species over others. I, I used a very generic version of value. Absolutely, generic version of value. Could you speak more to that? I'm just saying that something that is spectacular like an elephant or an ostrich is valued in a very generic sense, is appreciated, is weighted in conservation thinking far more than some tiny little insect or a little brown mouse or something like that. But they're all the, the results of independent evolutionary experiments. They're all as unique as any other. Right. I would agree. Why, give, no. them, why give the elephant more weight than that mouse or that shrew? That's a great point. Why give the elephant more weight, more value than a shrew? Where do you think that heightened value comes from? Say it louder. Sometimes visibility, because we can see the elephants. Visibility? Okay. Okay. They would value, they would value it more. What about the economic value from tourism. 
I think there was a paper in Ecological Economics which said uh, the value of an elephant to the Kenyan tourist economy is about $20,000 an elephant. That's, that's a really convincing argument, right? Let's preserve elephants and have lots of them. Right? What's that? What will the elephants eat? I don't know, you're the conservationist, you tell me. <laughs> I'm the social scientist. No, I'm kidding. Um, so, this is a launching off point to think about conservation successes and failures when it comes to particular species. Okay? So let's take the case of the elephant. We've done a little bit of legwork to get us to this point. Right? Elephants have large home ranges. Right? Uh, anyone know what the average migratory distance of an elephant is? Seven. About seventy kilometers. Seventy kilometers. I, I, I think I think that's a conservative estimate. I, th I would venture more like in the several hundred kilometers, maybe up to thousands of kilometers. No. Not daily migratory distance, but over the course of like a season. Sorry, we did not clarify the time scale on that, right? Um, elephants are high, uh, very complex social animals. They're highly intelligent, right? They communicate with infrasound, right? They have matriarchs that lead herds. But they're faced with these very serious threats, like the shrinking availability of protected areas. If elephants have large home ranges, do the single large or several small debates hold up? Or do we need several large instead of single, small, single large? Where is that land going to come from? We also, as you well know, have a horrible problem with ivory poaching. And so, given the, the economic value of tourism, given that, is a, that it is a charismatic megafauna, in much of Sub-Saharan Africa, we tended to prioritize areas for elephant conservation. Okay? Because of, of, of both the economic value, the revenue generation from tourism, but also that they were very charismatic. Right? And so they set aside large areas of land. And how, what do you do to establish tourism uh, visitation? You build camps and lodges, right? You build hotels. And the idea behind that is the elephant offers a series of economic multiplier effects. People coming to see the, the elephant will pay for their air tickets. Maybe they'll fly on Ethiopian Airlines, which is good for Ethiopian Airlines. right? They'll stay at the Addisinia Hotel, which is good for Addis Ababa. They will come on a tour bus, like we did. They will pay park entrance fees. They will provide tips and gratuities, all of which is helping the broader economy, right? Seen as a good thing. It was seen as this win-win scenario. And it was also a way by which we tend to care more for animals by anthropomorphizing them, right? We make them more human-like. Oh, look at the mother with its calf. Oh, it's suckling. Oh, look, they're having a bath. Is that unique? Am I, am I making this up? Have you all heard that? We anthropomorphize it, right? Have we ever heard that, oh, look, the hyena is, having, is, is in a dirty little mud hole? We don't really talk, think about it in that way. Okay. So this is a way to think about how we socially construct certain animals over others in order to achieve broad conservation value. Okay. And the way I want us to think about this notion of socially constructing animals is to use an example of fish. Tuna. How many of you had eaten tuna before? <laughs> sort of half up, but they're like, I don't want to admit it, but yeah, okay. Only for greater admitting. Now, tuna are really interesting to think about being socially constructed because they're representative of overfishing and collateral damage crises in the world's ocean. Right? Much like we would say livestock grazing is resulting in overgrazing. Right? And so if you look at the, the albacore, the skipjack, the bluefin, the yellowfin, um, 
the, you, if you look at the catch, it's actually going up. If you look at regardless of which ocean you're in, the Atlantic, the Indian, or the Pacific, it's the catch is going up, the numbers are going down, right? How many of you thought there was a crisis of tuna overfishing? How many of you have heard that? A few. Now, if I was to replace tuna with elephant, you would have all heard about the fact that all oh, elephant numbers are being hurt, right? So do we care more about the elephant or the fish? So are there animal rights for certain animals? Right? I mean, look at that. Does it doesn't look terribly charismatic, does it? It looks pretty ugly, in fact. Right? And so knowledgeable are conservation organizations about the image presented about certain wildlife. Town gave a gift example of a panda reserve. The panda is the emblematic symbol for which conservation organization? WWF, right? And so knowledgeable are they that they have advertising like, like this. Right? So they're well aware of this. <laughs> Elephants are charismatic megafauna. Right? Everyone wants a picture of an elephant. They're iconic. They're the largest land mammals. Right? They're giants. In fact, there's a conservation organization that is called Space for Giants, which is about elephant conservation. But here, now let's, let's talk about the conservation of elephants in Africa. If we look at the poaching numbers of elephants in Africa, 24,000 from 2000 to 2012 elephants were poached in Eastern Africa, 42,000 in Central Africa, 41,000 in Southern Africa. The range of elephants in 1979 was 1 1.3 million. The range in 2007, 472 to 690,000. 50% decline. So, those large land areas that we set aside for conservation, are they successful based on these metrics? Could someone close that door a little bit? Something. If we're going to define conservation successes, are raw numbers a way by which to do that? Mona? What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I the question. All right. Sure, raw numbers are fine. If your raw. objective is conserving elephants, then counting the numbers is a fine way to quantify yourself. OK. Um, Haidu, you work for? For the university. For the university? Okay. I'll let you off this time. Um, if, if uh, you work for Ethiopian Wildlife Conservation Authority, yes. in what way do numbers get prioritized as metrics of conservation success in Africa, in Ethiopia? Sorry. Is that something that you consciously evaluate? Uh, no. no? Okay. Fikreta, what do you think? I think if we have more of something somewhere then we tend to think we're being successful in that area okay I, I would agree with that if you look at it from NGOs this is from an NGO called 96 elephants I'll say we had 1.2 million elephants in 1980 and we're now down to 420,000 and they have this graph that illustrates it So this means, how many of you would agree, put your hands up, that this is a conservation failure? One, two, three, four. How many of you think it's a conservation success? <laughs> okay. 
please. <laughs> please, that's great. You have to have a reason. Because we conservationists tend to think that we need to conserve something when it is threatened, when the population is declining, when it's a lot, no one cares at all. That's a great point. Does a species have to be sufficiently threatened for it to matter for conservation? When populations are sufficiently threatened, then we should take action. Ben? Sorry, I'm having Kate do so much work. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think we, we started with discussing priorities. And I think one challenge in conservation is the availability of resources or funding, for example, funding and capacity. So we can do all at the same time. Okay. So we go for what is threatened and uh, with the meager resources we have so that we can achieve something. Okay. So that's why we have to do it at, at that level. Okay. Did you have a question, Kate? No, I was actually to say, it's you know, even though many of us would view this as not a conservation success, it's kind of successful in the sense that think of the population growth in those 22 years, think of the habitat change, the land use changes over that time, and the fact that we still have that many remaining, despite the fact that we're looking at areas across numerous countries and political um, issues going on. Right. So this has been great because quite a few of you have agreed that it's a cons conservation failure. Some of you have looked at it in terms of a conservation success. I, so I guess the rest of you th are neither here nor there. Mona? I think it depends on if you, you define the goal differently. So and who defines that goal? Well, in this room there were two sides defining goals differently. differently. Exactly. Two sides, two opinions yes, with right. different goals. So you can have different opinions based on how you define the what is the goal and what can we consider successful conservation outcome. Th that's a great point. And now think about it that if it was not just the two of us, but thousands of us, well, the, the goal evolves over time as well? The goal evolves over time, right? So what we're getting at, you know, all this wonderful head discussion is trying to push back on a commonly accepted standard of what is considered success. When we look at whether it's a success or failure, sometimes do we discuss success or failure based on where the products are going and how much demand there is. Everyone seems to think that the likely buyers of ivory, this is from the National Geographic, is China. But look at the Philippines, it's almost on par with China, Thailand, the US, Vietnam. Is it productive to lay blame as part of conservation strategy? Oh, it's the Chinese, they're the problem. Oh, it's the Filipino, are they the problem? Is that part of conservation strategy? And so prominent have these debates become that they grace the covers of news magazines. Right? They're on our newspapers. Now here, we largely seem to be thinking about savanna elephants which are quite larger in comparison to forest elephants. And so when we look at about the forest elephants, we can see that whether you're in the DRC, Gabon, Congo, Cameroon, or the Central African Republic, it looks like Gabon has actually done really well. Do we hear about Gabon as being an elephant conservation success story? Look what's happened in the Democratic Republic of Congo, 57 to 42 to 19. So, but remember, keep in mind, numbers are just part of the story. If we look at it spatially, elephant population by country, where are most of the elephants concentrated? Tanzania, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Botswana, South Africa, Namibia. These are countries that have tended to prioritize elephant conservation, right? 
And so to sum this up, does the increase of no raw numbers count as a success? Is an increase necessarily a good or a bad thing? And we've heard both sides of that. For whom? Conservationists? Local people will probably say, yeah, for me, a success is reduced number of elephants because they come and destroy my crop fields. Right? Now, here's a question. Does species conservation need to be balanced against other successes or failures? Like the point that Kate brought up. We've increased elephant numbers, but because we have limited resources, we've decided to prioritize elephants at the expense of the wolf. Is that still considered a success? Does an increase in some protected areas while a decrease in others make sense? States that have limited capacity. They can't afford to plug a lot of money into nature conservation, right? So scale matters here. Think about is does a success of a local area more important than wider continental trends? It depends on how we define success. What if we want to see an increase in the number of elephants across the continent? Is that realistic? According to whom? An idea that is often deployed in conservation success stories is that what has worked in one area will necessarily work in another. But the contexts are quite different. So we can think about the land set aside for elephant conservation as being considered a success story, but the decrease in the raw numbers as being a failure. Right? And, but this is for charismatic megafauna. What if you were conserving pangolins? That's still pretty charismatic. It's pretty cool. I want something that is brown, stinky, small, <laughs> and only, yeah, shrew's fine, or some insect, but something that only the taxonomist, the specialist, can distinguish from the next species on so the list. a reptile or an invert. Just something that is not at all impressive. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, that's a spectacular life yeah, that's strategy. Yeah, that's this right? is a spectacular animal. A donkey. To you. No. To you it's a spectacular. Anybody awesome. will look at that and say, what the hell is that? Is that a reptile? Is that a mammal? I don't so, find that cute. They're so cute. Look at them. Hi, Lou. Is that cute? <laughs> <laughs> How many have heard of pangolin just today? Oh, no? uh, yeah, we are in a room full of biologists. How many people have seen a pangolin? <gasps> <gasps> Two, three, four. How many of you have seen elephants? Mm. Now, would it surprise you to learn that pangolin is one of the most trafficked animals in the world? A hundred thousand pangolins are trafficked every year. 